I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And together, we host a true crime podcast called The Prosecutors. Every week, we bring our perspective as prosecutors to some of the toughest cold cases of all time. Disappearances, murder, mayhem, you name it, we'll cover it. So join us for a true crime podcast with a different point of view. Because we are The Prosecutors. This podcast may contain content that is graphic and disturbing in nature. Listener discretion is advised. It's been over four years since 34-year-old mother Sherry Papini vanished, then reappeared 22 days later, 15 pounds lighter with cut hair, a broken nose, and severe bruising. What happened to Sherry? Was she the victim of a brutal kidnapping, as she claims, or was this all a hoax? This is episode 37, The Sherry Papini Story. Hi, Megan. Hi, Amy. What a case today. I know <laughs> this. I know the name. I know the basic premise of the case. Like I knew it was a kidnapping or was it, but that's all I know. And I remember a picture of her in court. Is she? She's like a shortish blonde hair. Yes. Yeah. I remember that there was like a picture of her in a court case and she's smiling and it didn't look good, but I don't know anything else. Megan, I have to tell you that remember when you covered Cindy James? Yes. And I said that case might have been the most baffling I've ever heard. I think this case is up there. Let's that. see. I'll be the yeah, judge. There of that. are so many theories, and I can't wait to hear which one you think is the most plausible. Okay. Well, you better give me the facts of the case first. So, before we jump into Sherry Peppini, let's take a moment to thank our supporters. Let's do it. All right. First, I want to thank Mia. Awesome. Thank you, Mia. And Lauren Wittenbrook. Thank you, Lauren. Today, we also have Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, Carrie. And finally, we have Ray. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you, all of you guys. We really appreciate it. And just so listeners know, these are folks who support the show through Patreon. So they get their name read as a token of our thanks. They also get ad-free shows, t-shirts, stickers, AMAs, and video meetups. We're also over halfway to our goal to unlock exclusive bonus episodes. So if that interests you and you'd like to hear your name as a supporter, check us out on patreon.com or look in our show notes. And with that, it's time to get back to today's case. So who is Sherry Papini? Well, Sherry Papini was born June 11th, 1982, and she lived in Redding, California with her husband, Keith. They actually dated when they were younger. I read somewhere that in seventh grade, they were each other's first kiss. How cute Aww, is that? That is cute. But then, of course, as many do, they broke up. Sherry had a brief marriage in 2006. All I know is that it was very brief. And soon after, she started talking to Keith again. And they were married in 2009. Okay, Megan, let's fast forward a bit to 2016. The Papinis have two young children, just two and four years old. And they, by all accounts, were a very happy family. They lived in Keith's childhood home in Redding, California, which is in Northern California. Mm -hmm. People say they were private for the most part, but they were, you know, a nice, friendly family. Sherry was a stay-at-home mom, and Keith worked at Best Buy. Sherry was described as super mom, and she was very active in all of her children's activities. Now let's jump to the day of Sherry's disappearance. On November 2nd, 2016, everything seemed normal. Keith left for work, and Sherry got the kids ready for daycare and dropped them off before returning back home. A bit before 11 a.m., Sherry had texted Keith asking him if he'd be coming home for lunch. He, I guess he worked close to home, and sometimes he'd pop in since she was home. He had said that he was too busy and therefore he would not be coming home that day, which again is not abnormal either. Sometimes he would, sometimes he wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Sometime not long after this text conversation, Sherry left her home for a jog. Apparently this was typical for her because she was training for uh, some 5K marathon. Some reports say she left the home around 2 p.m., but we really can't be certain. We only know for sure that it was sometime between 11, which is around the time of the text message, and 2 p.m. She likely went to the same trail as she normally did. They lived in a very remote kind of rural area. So about a mile from her home, there was a trail that she would often run to. Okay. Keith returned home from work that evening a little bit before six, and he was surprised to see that Sherry's car was in the driveway, but the home was empty because typically Sherry would pick up the kids around 4.30 from daycare. Okay. 
Keith says he first called the daycare to see what time the kids were picked up, and he was informed that the kids were in fact still there, that they were not picked up. He said this is the first point where he started to get a little concerned because he knows that she would absolutely never forget her children. Some people found this a little curious, but next he checked, find my iPhone? Well, yeah, why is that curious? Isn't that kind of a smart thing to do when you can't locate someone? Yes, there were some people that said, why didn't he call or text her? Oh, I Because he went okay. straight to, you know, find my iPhone. And, you know, we can talk about this later when we talk about different theories. But basically, he saw that her phone was pinging nearby the, at the end of their street. Their mailbox was about a mile from their home. Like I said, it was a very rural area. You know how some areas have like, a bunch of mailboxes together, and then the homes are spread out. Yes. So the phone was pinging nearby at the end of the street. So, of course, that's where he goes. He does not find Sherry, but he finds her iPhone with her earbuds placed on top of the iPhone. And what he says was her hair tangled in them. Okay, because maybe the headphones pulled some hair. You would think, but it, you can look at these pictures online and mm -hmm. you see it's a phone. Okay. It's almost placed, placed right in the grass with the earbuds right on top. It was the wire, the kind with the wire, not like the wire. So it doesn't kind. look like it was strewn. It looks like it was placed. Exactly. But before picking up the phone, he took pictures of it. That was smart. You say smart. Other people are going to say, why is he taking a picture of it if he's frantic looking for his missing wife? Anyway, he says then he drives around a bit to see if he could find her. And once he does not find her, he calls 911. Now, I want you to keep in mind that about two hours have elapsed between the time he gets home and the time he calls 911. The 911 call is available online, so I urge you all to listen to it. He sounds extremely calm, but expresses concern. He does say, quote, I'm telling you something has happened to her. Her hair was ripped out or her hair got ripped out. All right. Well, I mean, he saw the hair on the yeah. phone, though. So, okay, so I'm, nothing. I'm, not, I'm yeah. not too concerned yet. Okay. Of course, at this point, the police come to the house and they start to process the scene. Not surprisingly, Megan, who do you think they look at first? Well, the husband, of course. Yeah. The police are always going to look at those closest to the victim or the potential victim. It did not take long for them to rule him out, though. Keith was given and passed a lie detector test. The police were also able to quickly confirm his whereabouts on the day of Sherry's disappearance. Remember, he was at work all day, so... Yeah, I figured that'd be easy enough to confirm. It was very easy. So was there any physical evidence in the house of a struggle or anything like that? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay. Something I was just curious I wanted to ask you about, so... You know what, when they give a lie detector test and if somebody fails a lie detector test, they're still looked at as a suspect, even though it's not admissible in court. How come when somebody passes a lie detector test, we are so quick to assume that that is correct? Is it us or the police that, because the police are using it, the lie detectors as an investigative tool, right? Actually, often when police administer polygraphs and people pass, they're likely then to move on to another yeah, suspect. Should they? If like, Could there not be false positives, false negatives? Yes. The problem is that law enforcement has too much faith in polygraphs. And I, I don't mean to diminish polygraph examiners or anything mm -hmm. because it's come a long way, mm -hmm. certainly. But law enforcement relies on it heavily, whereas we look at it and we realize it's not as reliable. And that's why it's not mm -hmm. admissible. I just find it interesting that we that we choose to use it in one way and not the other. And I'm not suggesting that Keith was lying and it didn't pick it up. I'm just, it just made me think about that. Keith was very vocal. You could see him on several media outlets pleading for her safe return. I haven't seen. No, I don't remember that. I remember her, but I yes. don't remember him. Megan, this story was international. I mean, he was on Good Morning America. Wow, I didn't realize it was that big. Yeah, it really was. Throughout all of these public appearances, he is sobbing and shaking. And if he's faking that, I'm telling you, he's damn good. But he is pleading with kidnappers for her safe return. So it's almost like there's this narrative. I'm not sure that he says kidnappers, but it's very quickly somebody took her. There was almost no other plausible explanation. I'm not sure where that came from. Okay. So as I mentioned, coverage of this case really grew. The public was very invested in this case. I actually remember hearing about it and we're on the opposite coast, right? I was in New York at the time. Everyone's looking for Sherry. You had federal, state, local law enforcement, hundreds of volunteers. Keith was extremely involved in the daily search. There were absolutely no signs of Sherry and zero indications of where she could be or what happened. Meanwhile, as you know, the public was rallying around Keith, the investigation was moving forward. Investigators were conducting interviews with family and friends, as we would expect. They were filing search warrants. They were looking into local sex offenders. They were looking at surveillance videos gathered from homes and businesses in the area, combing through cellular data, doing all the things that they normally do. But they found nothing. There were no viable leads. No one had seen or heard a thing. Wow. 
As we often see with family members, Keith was very frustrated with the investigation. And I think it's sometimes the emotion. Nothing's ever going to be enough, I feel like, when it's a family. Also, police don't always apprise you as to every step they're doing and all the information they're collecting to preserve, actually, the integrity of their investigation. But so you may feel like they're not doing. You're absolutely right. Nonetheless, Keith was frustrated, so he started mobilizing his own search. As I mentioned, he had hundreds of volunteers. He also created a GoFundMe page to raise money for a private investigator, and he later hired one. Wow. And this GoFundMe, again, this is going to come back up, but he raised a About $50,000. That's great. The police were not thrilled about this because they felt that it could compromise their investigation. The police don't want there to be these side investigations because, like you said, they might be holding back certain information on purpose. I understand that completely, but I've seen this work both ways, whereas the family doing that helped and sometimes it harms. So if it was my family member and I I would probably mobilize and do everything I could. I agree. This makes me think, sorry, it just makes me think of the Laura Bible case. You remember when her mother came over and they actually discovered evidence at the scene? So I think I'd be on the proactive side too. You're right. That was one of those examples where a good thing the family got involved. The police were also not very happy because... After one of Keith's many public pleads, some random guy came forward and offered lots of money. First, it was a $50,000 reward for her safe return. And then it, at some point, it became 100000 But this person remained anonymous. Apparently, they had gone to the sheriff's office first, and the sheriff's office told them not to do anything. But then they got in touch with Keith through a mutual friend. And they also got a negotiation kidnapping expert involved named Cameron Gamble. Have you ever heard of him? No. So Cameron Gamble made a video to request the ransom, and he gave a 100-hour deadline. The whole situation was really bizarre because there was no indication that, number one, she was kidnapped, or number two, that someone was holding her for ransom. Yeah, that's a little, it seems preempted. It really seems like it. But again, like you said, if it's your family, are you going to jump through these hoops? And no one ever apparently was just a local entrepreneur who came forward offering the money, but it was never confirmed who this person was. Okay. Cameron Gamble made another video once the anonymous donor doubled the reward to $100,000. And this was on November 23rd, which was about 21 days after Sherry went missing. Okay. So Sherry's been missing for three weeks at that point. Yep. Hmm. But the next day... Just 22 days after Sherry went missing, she reappeared. Where? On Thanksgiving morning, a motorist was driving down a rural road. And we're talking about 150 miles away from Reading. The early morning hours, a bit after 4 a.m., and she notices a panicked and frightened wide-eyed woman on the side of the road. Megan, can you imagine driving down a rural road at 4.30 in the morning and seeing a woman, not only does she look panicked, she is chained And she is waving a piece of fabric or some sort of article of clothing to flag someone down. Not only can I not imagine that, I can't imagine actually being awake at four o'clock in the morning (laughs) or driving anywhere at four o'clock. Well, it was Thanksgiving, so she was on her way to see family. She was taking quite a long drive, and this woman was with her daughter on the way to visit family for the Thanksgiving holiday. Well, that's one hell of a memorable, (sighs) memorable drive. Right? Not surprisingly, she was a little scared. She did not pull over to help the woman, but she did pull over up ahead and she called 911. Surveillance videos from a nearby church would later reveal that before heading to this road, Sherry was running around frantically trying to get help. She tried to get into a nearby Jehovah Witness church. She also knocked on a residence, but there was no answer. So Sherry looked a little bit different now than she did 22 days earlier. She had lost a lot of weight. She was only 87 pounds when they found her. What? This was, she was petite to begin with, but this was still 15% of her body weight. Wow. She had a broken nose. She was severely beaten. Some bruises were fresh. Others were older based on how they were healing. She was branded. What do you mean branded? Hold on to that for a minute. And her beautiful long blonde hair had been chopped off. She was wearing a dark gray sweatshirt and light gray sweatpants. And people say this was pretty underdressed considering it was a freezing night. She had a chain around her waist. Her left wrist was tethered to the chain by a zip tie. She also had what is called hose clamps around her ankles. As later explained by investigators, this is a form of pain-compliant restraints. Oh, my God. Yes. And she also had deep gashes on her neck and her wrists. The description sounds like this woman's been through an ordeal. Yeah, it sure does. When police approached Sherry, she immediately told them who she was and that she was abducted and held captive, although she really was not able to provide much information. And I don't blame her. I mean, it sounds like she had been through a hell of an ordeal. Well, right away, you you know, she's probably in shock. She's malnourished. She probably can't think clearly immediately. 
Some reports say she was hysterical, even belligerent, and not able to speak much. She was able to tell police that there were two adult Hispanic women. One woman had straight hair, one woman had curly hair. Both women were armed. She said she was unable to give much of a description because she avoided looking the women in the face because she was fearful that they would beat her. She received a ton of criticism for the fact that she could not recall much. But Megan, as we know, trauma can do that. Yeah, we definitely know that. People underestimate trauma. Right? Sorry, before you go on, where was she abducted from? Was she able to tell them that? From where she went jogging when she was by her house a mile away. So she was abducted on her jog. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And you know what? They never actually make that clear in any of the reports, but it's implied. Okay. She was taken to the hospital where she's reunited with Keith. I think people, as they normally do, they were really looking at Keith. And Keith explains that he was up shaving when he missed the call from the officer because the officers were calling him to tell him that they found Sherry. Okay. And some people say, why is he shaving at 4.30 in the morning? I don't He's know. an early riser and that's uh, when he shaves? Yeah, I whatever. Mean, I- this is the thing though, Meg. People really look at everything under a microscope. He missed the call. They end up calling his house phone and he is told, you know, be prepared. We found Sherry. He hears Sherry yelling in the background. He says he's elated. But while relieved, he was very horrified to see her. And he says he felt sick to his stomach. And you can see him. I believe he went on 2020 not long after Sherry returned. Sherry never made a public appearance, but Keith did. And he is hysterical talking about it. And again, you can see the raw emotion. She was treated and released fairly quickly and taken to an undisclosed location where police tried to get more information. But again, she really didn't have that much to say. She did tell a forensic interviewer that at one point she slammed one of her captors' heads into a toilet when she was allowed to leave her captivity room for a shower and that she got a severe cut on her right foot in the fight. Okay. This would come back to be a problem because when she was processed at the hospital, there was no evidence of a cut seen in any photographs. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. Right. But statements like this caused people to question Sherry's credibility. She was held in captivity for a certain period of time. Was there sexual assault? There was not a sexual assault. No signs of a sexual assault. Over the next few months, Sherry talked to the police often and told them tidbits, but really nothing substantial. She did reveal that the women mostly spoke Spanish. She revealed that one woman was wearing earrings and had curly hair, but their their faces were covered most of the time. She said one was in their 20s and one was a bit older. Sherry says she was held in a small, dirty cell and beaten multiple times and kept in chains. She also told police that the day they let her go, she heard them arguing and then she heard a gunshot and that one of the women then took her in the car and dumped her on the road in which she was eventually found on. When the cold weather keeps us inside, one of my favorite ways to mentally escape is to curl up and get lost in a show. I grab my furry blanket, I curl up on the couch, and nothing feels more transportive when I'm stuck indoors than watching brilliant TV from across the pond. That's why I have Acorn TV. Acorn TV is a commercial-free streaming service that's rooted in British television. It's home to sophisticated and artful storytelling with top-rated mysteries, addicting dramas, heartfelt comedies, and so much more. Megan, what have you been watching? Oh, I just binge watched over a weekend two shows that I thought were so amazing. One of them is Manhunt. That one is a three-part series about the true capture of a serial killer. It was so fabulous. But the other one, oh my God, it's called The Secret. And it's the true story of the consequences of an affair between a married man and a married woman. Ooh. It really shows you that true life is so much stranger than fiction. I'm telling you, this one was a nail biter. All right. I loved it. That's my next one. I just finished Mystery Road, so I need something. I get really lost in these crime shows, and, and I do it curled up on my couch. Plus, you get thousands of hours of new, refreshing content on Acorn TV for a fraction of the cost compared to most streaming services at just $5.99 a month. I love to watch it on my Apple TV. That's just my preference. But you can watch it wherever you can access Acorn TV. Escape to Britain and beyond without leaving your seat. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and use my promo code WOMEN. That's acorn, A-C-O-R-N dot TV, code WOMEN, to get 30 days free. Green Chef is the first USDA-certified organic meal kit company. Green Chef makes eating well easy and affordable with plans to fit every lifestyle. Whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, or just looking to eat healthier, there's a range of recipes to suit any diet or preference. 
Ingredients come pre-measured, perfectly portioned, and mostly prepped so you can spend less time stressing and more time enjoying delicious home-cooked meals. Green Chef is the first ever and only keto meal kit on the market. It makes sticking to low-carb lifestyle easy with recipes averaging only 14 net carbs each. Last night, we had the chicken lemon cremini. It was absolutely to die for, and it's keto, and you would never know it. What was that other one? The one you sent me, it was divine. It was the beginning of the week, the, the first one. The steak and cheddar melt. It had a kale salad, and carrots, dried figs, a white wine vinaigrette, And then it was almost like a cheesesteak on this delicious, delicious bun. Fabulous. As you can see, Amy and I cannot get enough of our Green Chef. Our partners love it. Me and Alan actually enjoy cooking together. That's rare. And Mm -hmm. James and I love doing them together too. I think because they give you such easy directions, it just takes the stress out of it. It really does. Go to greenchef.com slash women90 and use code Women 90 to get $90 off, including free shipping. Again, that is women 90 to get $90 off, including free shipping at greenchef.com slash women 90. When they dumped her out, she says she had a bag on her head, which she managed to get off before she went running for help. The police were baffled, as I'm sure you are right now. Megan. Absolutely baffled. Baffled. For one, abductions are rare in themselves. They are. So not only are abductions rare, stranger abductions even rarer, adult abductions even rarer, abductors being women even rarer. I mean, that's exactly what I was thinking. This is all so unique. And when there is an abduction, it's more likely to be a child abduction than an adult abduction. But again, even child abductions are very rare. I know, you know, parents like to warn their kids of stranger danger, but... Abductions are somewhere around one in 300,000. And child abductions are usually a custodial issue. So it's usually a a parental or a family member who is doing the kidnapping. Yep. Stranger abductions are very rare. And it's interesting when you look at the statistics, number one, the UCR doesn't report adults separately from kidnapping. So when you look at kidnapping, they don't parse out adults and children because when you're an adult, If you're missing, you could have left on your own accord or it could be foul play. So it's really hard to say. When we talk about missing persons in general, when we look at females, the majority are under 21 years of age, almost 250,000. When we look at older than 21, that number drops to about 60,000. So the majority of these missing women are under the age of 21. And for anyone who doesn't know, sorry, Amy, you mentioned the UCR. The UCR is the Uniform Crime Report, which is a crime statistics source compiled by the FBI where they count all crimes reported to local police departments across the United States. Yes. So with all that being said, investigators are baffled. They were even looking for similar cases to try to establish, you know, an MO from offenders, and they found absolutely nothing. There had been no cases discovered that were similar in nature, again, concerning the pattern of operations by the suspects, the treatment of the victim, and the release of the captured victim. And despite the initial 600 plus tips, they were not able to generate any viable lead or information. They did find an unknown male DNA profile on Sherry's clothes, the clothes that she was wearing when she was found. But didn't she say that it was her captors were female? Yes, they did also find an unknown female DNA on her. But in addition, they found the unknown male DNA was more interesting to them because it didn't match her story. Okay. It didn't match Keith. Um, Of course, they ran it through CODIS to see if it matched any known offenders. I also read somewhere that they did some genetic genealogy to see if they could find anything, but nothing as far as we know. Is this DNA even relevant? I mean, it could have been maybe a man she was with if she was lying, or it, if it was, it could have been one of her captors, husbands, brothers, boyfriends, clothes, who knows, Couldn't right? this also be touch or transfer DNA? Yeah, so, you know, I think they're just looking for anything. Right. They even showed Sherry's pictures of various SUVs that were in her neighborhood around the time of her disappearance, but she did not recognize any of them because she did tell them that it was a dark color SUV. Something else of importance that I mentioned earlier is that Sherry was branded on her right shoulder. Right. I've been dying to hear about this. Yeah. There is not much on it, Megan. Some reports say that the branding was scabbed over when she was found, possibly indicating it happened earlier on in her captivity. Others say, we don't even know where the branding is. It has been said that it's on her right shoulder. Other people say, it, you know, that's not true. We don't know much about the brand other than that the message was unclear because of, quote, obscure letters and poor quality. 
Either way, investigators won't reveal what they do know about the brand because, obviously, it's for the integrity of the investigation. Right, okay. Aw. But, of course, just having the branding at all has people speculating that this may indicate gang or sex trafficking involvement. But as you brought up before, there's absolutely no evidence that she was sexually assaulted, and she also reports that she was not sexually assaulted. So what would the motive be? And also trafficking. She's young and I know she was an attractive woman, but a little old for trafficking purposes. Keith was interviewed several times after her return. He was very emotional and reported that Sherry's captors physically abused her by beating her, branding her and starving her and that her signature long blonde hair had been chopped off. She had been branded. He said that he could feel the scabs of her branding. He also said she was thrown from a vehicle with a chain around her and a bag over her head. And apparently the bag that was over her head is the bag that she used to flag down someone when she was able to free her hands. So Sherry was very quiet. The local media were all over this case. Like I said, it did make national and even international news. But once she came home, it was more the local media that was really interested in what she looks like and what's going on. People had a lot of questions and people were questioning her. There were one or two spottings, um, her at a pizza place, her at a Costco, But she really remained out of the public eye. I'll bet. About a year after Sherry had returned home, she had given enough info so that a composite sketch could be made. But otherwise, that was the only thing that came out of this. So the composite sketch. Again, look them up online. You know how there's web sleuths and there's Reddit and people love having theories, which we're going to get into the theories in just a moment. But people really read into these composite sketches. And some people thought that the composite sketches looked like Sherry. Really? I can't wait to Sherry. look them up. But I don't know if you've heard this before, but there's a theory that says when people are lying, mm-hmm. they're more likely to subconsciously give information about themselves. Yes. So this wouldn't be the first time that this happened. Someone mentioned in the Jody Arias case that the sketch resembled her. I don't necessarily buy that, but I do think it's an interesting It's an interesting theory. I personally don't see the resemblance between the composite sketch and Sherry, but hey, take a look. Let me know what you all think. So as often happens, the case went cold, but there are no shortage of theories in this case. A lot of people found Keith to be sketchy, but police seem to be looking for a possible abductor in the community. So what I want to do now, Megan, is go through the many theories that have been floated. Some seem a lot more plausible than others, but I'm curious what you think. Let's do it. Megan, what do you think the number one theory is here? She did this to herself. Yep. This was staged. It was a hoax. This seems to be where a lot of the public landed. Some experts even came forward questioning the validity of Sherry's story. Did Sherry have a boyfriend? Sherry did not have a boyfriend, but she was texting with a Michigan man. She reportedly planned to meet up with the man when he came to California for business a few days before she disappeared. But investigators later determined that they didn't actually meet up and he was not involved in her disappearance at all. I think they executed like 20 search warrants in Detroit, Michigan, where this man was from. You want want to know what Sherry did, which didn't look good for her. She had saved his name under a woman's name in her phone. Uh, So, I mean, some say shady. Others say maybe it was just a friend and she didn't want Keith to get upset over it. Either way, the messages were never released between the two. And they were put to rest that this man in Michigan had anything to do with it. But back to what I was saying, some experts even came forward questioning the validity of Sherry's story. But then you have other people that really supported Sherry. For example, even the mayor came forward and said he believed her story and felt for the family. As far as I know, or as far as reported, they never gave Sherry a polygraph. The police were a bit hesitant, I think, to question her story. The woman who found Sherry also very much believed her story. Because if you come across a site like that, at 4 a.m., you know, this woman battered and beaten, you, of course, would you believe what you see. And as some people would question, could Sherry really have done all of that to herself? And for what reason? Well, the only reason now, if we've eliminated a boyfriend, would be for the attention, because maybe she was feeling underattended to. She wanted to make her husband value her again. Maybe she wanted, you would argue, maybe she wanted some spotlight. But since she stayed out of the spotlight, it might have been about what she needed from her husband at (laughs) home. Exactly. So some people say, was it money or attention? You know, was she a narcissist? But yeah, so was it a hoax that Sherry conducted on her own, maybe to get attention from Keith? Or was Keith in on it? Some people think that Keith and Sherry were actually in on it together. For the GoFundMe, the the money? The GoFundMe. There was also some, again, web sleuth Reddit talk about how the couple wanted a reality show and how they were, you know, people say they were private. So at the same time, this kind of contradicts itself. But people really focused on that phone, right? Why did the placement of the phone look so staged? 
Why was it not thrown? Did she do it? Did Keith do it? I'm not sure that I buy that Keith was involved. Like I said, he was very emotional. But this is all totally possible. We've seen cases like this before, especially with younger people, though, not so much adults. Do you know the case of Carol Sanchez? I don't. Somewhat recently, she was a Bronx teenager, and she was walking down the street with her mom, and four men jumped out of a car and grabbed her. Less than 48 hours later, she resurfaced and admitted that she staged it. What was her motive? Um, Attention from her mom, you know, that kind of thing. There's many others. I mean, when it comes to adults, it's much less common, but it still happens. Do you know Adam Hoover? No. Adam Hoover is a gay rights activist in Ohio, and he posted for help on social media saying, help me, I'm in the trunk, someone kidnapped me. Police launched this huge manhunt, and then he was found later unharmed. The movie Gone Girl. Oh, gosh. <sighs> yeah. Fotis Dulos claimed Jennifer Dulos did this, you know, gone girl herself. Um, also, there was this woman recently in West Virginia who staged her own death to get out of paying a legal fee. Wow. You can't make this stuff up, right? So going back to Sherry's mental health. So did Sherry, in fact, do this? And if she did, is she suffering from some sort of mental health issue or a mental health break? She does have a history of issues with her family, and there's some shady stuff because, as you know, you know they're going to dig into everything now. What are her? What are the issues? In 2000, Sherry's father and her sister made separate complaints, accusing her of breaking into their homes on different occasions. Um, something else in 2003, Sherry's mother allegedly told police that her daughter had been self-harming and blaming the injuries on her. Uh, whether or not there was any evidence of self-harm is unknown. Like I mentioned, the father had made some reports against her. Sherry had tried to make unauthorized withdrawals from his bank account. So you could look at this and say she has a pretty rocky relationship or an estranged relationship with her family. Were these little incidences that we're now blowing out of proportion because we're digging into every little bit? Maybe it's just taken out of context, right? Or is Sherry someone who is capable of self-harming, capable of manipulation and capable of all these other things? Wow. Either way, it seems clear that the family, at least some of them, don't stand by Sherry's story at all. I mean, Keith stands by her, correct? Keith very much stands by her. He acted in a way that a seriously concerned husband would to me. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure yet what my final conclusion is, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah. The next theory I find a bit outlandish. The theories get a a little crazier from here. So, Megan, you mentioned this before, sex trafficking, right? right? So why does this look like sex trafficking? Well, the branded chains... They also, they also beat him to establish a pattern of dominance and control. So the abuse is usually yes. a, a theme here. Well, you know what? It fits the Hollywood version of sex trafficking, but it doesn't actually fit what really happens with sex trafficking. Like when we talked about Ghislaine Maxwell, right? Number one, you mentioned before, victims are often younger. Sherry was attractive and you know she was on the younger side, but sex traffickers wouldn't have cut her hair or make her lose weight. Like you no. said, they would beat her to just... Yep. establish authority but yep so the hollywood version of sex trafficking is you know woman grabbed off the street thrown mm. into a car beaten however megan we know that real life instances of trafficking are often quite different and consist of a young person being groomed for a period of time and eventually trusting their abusers and then with the trust in place the traffickers don't need to kidnap their victims that's true right so they get lured into a situation traffickers tend to prey on people who are economically or socially vulnerable mm-hmm Right. So youth, Sherry doesn't fit that. Living in poverty, Sherry doesn't fit that. Living on the streets, Sherry doesn't fit that. I don't think Sherry was sex trafficked. No, I I don't think that's the I I could be wrong, but I don't think it's the impetus here now. Yeah, I agree. And then then there was a theory that maybe she had drug issues. So maybe it was a drug deal gone bad or maybe she was kidnapped by someone in the drug world or maybe she went on a drug bender on her own. There was a lot of meth houses in the area in Redding, California. Any history of drug use that we know of with her? Some say her and Keith smoked a lot of marijuana, used some other. But again, Megan, a lot of this is just theories by web sleuths and people on Reddit. So I'm not going to say. I have no clue what their private life was like. Again, some indication that she may have used drugs at some point, but to what extent, I have no idea. You ready for the craziest theory? All right. Some people say maybe it was part of a race war. I don't understand because she's blonde, white, female. Let me give you some background. So there's a white supremacist website called skinheads.com. And there was an essay published under Sherry's maiden name where she details violent high school altercations with Latino students who hated her for being, quote, drug free, white and proud of my blood and heritage. You can find this online. Wow. I think this is ludicrous. 
I'm not going to spend much time dissecting it. Whether or not Sherry, in fact, wrote this, some people say somebody else wrote it. It's so hard to know. It's so hard to... I really don't see this as a viable motive here. No, the only reason why I'm mentioning it is because it's been floated around. Okay. Finally, it's possible she was kidnapped for some unknown reason, as you mentioned. We know that the principal motives for kidnapping are to subject the victim to some form of involuntary servitude, like you mentioned. That's what I was talking about with forced labor. Of course, sexual assault would fall under that. There was no evidence of sexual assault. People are also kidnapped for a monetary gain, such as to obtain ransom for safe release. There is no evidence of this at all. So what happened here? <laughs> You're right. This is as bizarre as Cindy James. I'm going to... Are, are you finished? Um, so I do have a, I have a little more on like aftermath where we are now. But since we're talking about theories, I am curious. Well, let me ask you this before I get to it. Was she ever charged with anything in the courts? She was not charged with anything. And I do want to say, I think I know why. So it seems as though the investigators were too afraid to commit one way or another. I read somewhere, a source said that they were afraid of, quote, getting egg on their face. Right. Well, and I think that was the right move. I don't think that they had enough evidence to charge her with faking it. That's, I just didn't know if that's where we were going. So it seems like there's two main options here. It was either a ho- Actually, I guess there's three. It was a hoax that Sherry did on her own. It was a hoax that involved Keith. Or this was a kidnapping for an unknown reason. If I had to lean anyway, uh, without knowing, you know, everything, I don't think Keith was involved. This could be something that she did. But I'm going to say that this is a legit kidnapping. And uh, the physical, the extent of the physical injuries seem to show that. And I'm going to say that there's a motive. Obviously, we don't know the motive. It's odd there were two female captors. I I could say that they might have captured her for a purpose. And they might have even, again, it might have been some type of servitude. Um, literally, whether it's a forced nanny, a forced maid, a forced something. You don't know. Someone might have wanted a blonde, attractive, you know, female for other purposes. And, you know, they just use that time to try to condition her. Mm-hmm. And that's a possibility. Why would they let her go without ever getting money? You or- s- it sounded like the two of them were arguing about it. Maybe one of them was having a change of heart about yeah. it. Maybe one of them realized this was wrong as they're watching her decompensate, lose weight as they're watching her become a shell of a person. I mean, it's possible one of them just had a change of heart and decided it wasn't worth it. It's possible also they in- intended to ask for a ransom, but again, just had a change of heart. Mm-hmm. Like all of these things are possible. Yeah. I don't I don't know. It doesn't make much sense, but if I had to lean one way, that's where I would go. Where would you go? I think I'm with you on that. First of all, I would rather be wrong and give her the benefit. You know, I would rather support a liar than disregard a victim. Yes. Because do you know the Denise Huskins case? I think I do know that one. And I remember that they treated them so badly. I want to bring that up briefly here because I think I think this case might have been one of the reasons why police were so tight-lipped. Really, actually so tight-lipped on the whole case, but also on whether or not they thought this was a hoax or not, because there was a woman who claimed she was kidnapped and raped. The police said that, you know, she didn't act like a victim and that she pulled a gone girl. Long story short, they were wrong. Denise was very much a victim Big story happens, and she wins a $2.5 million settlement oh, then that makes against sense. the police. So I think it's pretty clear that the police do not want to embarrass themselves the way that the other officers do. I hope it's also because, as you said, they don't want to disregard a victim. It's just so weird that there's no motive in this case. When kidnappings go on that long, they don't end well, right? The longer someone's missing, the less likely you are to find them alive. Yes, it's usually because when they're kidnapped and it's a stranger abduction, they're usually within the, dead within 24 to 48 hours. Yeah, because they're kidnapped for a reason, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, and- this is, I mean, this is one of the rarest types of abductions I've heard of. So the fact that there's no motive, it's perplexing. And the fact that there's a 100,000 reward that still stands. Wow. That has never been claimed. What about the GoFundMe money? Did they ever use it, claim it? So the GoFundMe money was used apparently for investigative purposes, which is possible because remember, Keith did hire an investigator. He had all these posters and, you know, no one knows exactly for sure, but it was only $50,000. I'm not saying that's not a lot of money, but no, to do all of this. It's not a mo- it's a, that does not scream motive to me. Now, the case is considered cold. The reward money still stands and the Papini family currently lives very quietly. Some people say they barely leave their home because of all the media attention and when they do leave their home, they get harassed. Every so often we see a news article pop up 
the two of them going to get pizza and you see pictures and she has her arm around on Keith's arm. Like she looks like still very much a shell of herself. In all photos of Sherry since, she seems to cling to Keith and she seems very reserved. This is so sad that if she in fact is a victim that she's being treated like this. It's being double traumatized. It's, she's traumatized it's twice. But we also know that people do crazy things. So where do we go from here? I think she's a victim. One thing I want to add, in October 2020, very recently, the police received a tip Okay, from a man, uh, a man from Southern California who claims that he was with Sherry for those 22 days and that it was all a hoax. Okay. That's it. That's all I know. New York Post and a few other smaller news outlets put out this information and I've heard nothing since and it's only a couple of weeks. So I'm going to... Stay on it. We'll do an update. I think we should because I want to know what his credibility and what his story is and if he's just not someone popping up out of the woodwork for alternative reasons. So the only way to end here is to say that the Sherry Papini kidnapping case remains very much an open and active investigation. Some call it a cold case, but the Shasta County Sheriff's Office would say it's very much active and that it is a very unique case. And they say that it requires a unique handling. And that's why things are taking so long. And that's why the public knows very little about what's going on. Amy, I have to thank you. That is one of the most interesting cases. Uh, We'd love to know what you guys think about it. Because I mean, I think we're both still a little unsure. So let us know, Uh, you know, is she a victim? Is she part of it? But anyway, I am thank- very curious because it seems from the research I did, it seems that the public is leaning towards hoax. I would lean away from hoax, I think, if I had to choose. So I'm curious what our listeners think. Yeah, let us know. Thanks so much, Amy. Great job. Great case. And thanks so much, everyone. We'll catch you next time on Women in Crime. Thanks, Megan. Now we're going to turn to our patrons question. Okay, now that we're done with our episode for today, we have two questions from patrons. Okay. The first question we have today, Megan, is from Mia. And Mia wants to know what case has been the biggest struggle for you to cover? Okay. I know exactly what you're going to say, but go ahead and say it. Shanda Sharer yep, was absolutely. the worst case. 12-year-old, she was tortured. And then actually, as a spoiler alert, I can also tell you that Shannon Christian, it, we covered that one. It's not released yet, but heartbreaking. Those two were the absolute worst for me. I agree. Being on the receiving end of those were very difficult as I well. I know. I'm sorry. For you? I actually, I had a lot of trouble with Joanne Parks because oh. I guess since I have two children that are around the same age of her children that perished in the fire and she was convicted and I believe wrongfully convicted, that one hit home for me. Okay. Thank you for that question, Mia. And then we have a question from Carrie. Carrie says she is a non-criminology educator in Florida and she finds herself concerned with many topics that we discuss. However, she doesn't know how to help. She wants to know what organizations or agencies do we suggest for volunteering or to support causes such as restoration of felon rights, reentry support, and the fight against discriminatory sentencing. Carrie, I really appreciate that question because that's why we do this, because we want our listeners to take action. As we always say, one of the most important things you could do is to vote. Yes, Amy, totally. Voting, especially in local elections, is so critical challenging your legislators, asking them hard questions, and then holding them accountable later to their promises. We also have some websites on our Women in Crime podcast. There are resources there for people who want to get involved. Uh, I can also tell you that there are a number of organizations who specialize in criminal justice reform. So one of them is the Sentencing Project. They do research and advocacy. If you click on their website, they have ways that you can help support their mission. Uh, The Equal Justice Initiative describes many ways to get involved, including voting and supporting local organizations and supporting local education. You could also donate or volunteer for the Marshall Project. So there are a number of ways that people can get involved. Thanks for asking. That was a great question. Mia and Carrie, thank you so much for your questions. And to everyone else, we'll see you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer and editor is James Varga. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show while gaining access to ad-free episodes, exclusive AMAs, and other bonus content for a small monthly contribution through Patreon. For more information, visit patreon.com slash womenincrime. Sources for today's episode, New York Post, ABC News, MSNBC, Sacramento Bee, People.com, 2020 on ID, Reading.com.